Global Conservation Corps presents the Rhino Man podcast. I'm John Jerko, your host and one of the directors of Rhino Man the Movie. This podcast series is a way for me to interview top conservationists on the topics of rhinos, the poaching crisis, the importance of rangers, and community engagement, all as a way to create awareness around these issues and to promote the coming release of our documentary film. In this episode, I'm talking with Grant Miller, MBE. Grant started his career in the military and then moved to law enforcement where he worked in customs and border control in UK, predominantly in the area of narcotic trafficking. His last years of service were as the head of the UK's National CITES Enforcement Team and chair of the Interpol Wildlife Crime Working Group. He now works as a law enforcement specialist at the Zoological Society of London, or ZSL. In this conversation, we talk about Grant's begrudging transition from law enforcement narcotics to a role in CITES enforcement, and why he eventually fell in love with it. We go deep into all of the wide-ranging conservation and research projects that ZSL is involved in around the world. And we talk at length about the importance and challenges of rangers, spending a lot of time talking about trauma and mental health. So much passion, knowledge, and wisdom in this episode. Before we jump into the conversation, I want to thank everyone who's been listening to the podcast. It's been a labor of love, and I hope it brings you value. If you want to support the podcast, please like and subscribe to it on whatever podcast platform you use. And please take the time to leave a rating or review. These both bring visibility to the podcast and help it grow. Finally, talk about it with your friends and share it online. If the podcast continues to grow, I will happily continue producing it. These conversations and your kind words bring me joy. Now, without further ado, let's dive into the conversation with Grant Miller. All right, welcome to the Rhino Man podcast, Grant. It's a pleasure to have you on here. Great to be here and to talk with you again, John. Yeah, excited to dive in. We had a, a nice little conversation a couple of months back, and I was learning more about all of the amazing work you're doing. And I, we, we tried to meet up, I think, at the Global Summit in London with United for Wildlife last year, but it was just everyone was in passing and a lot was going on. But yeah, really glad to finally get you on here and dig into a lot of the work you've been doing. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, it's ZSL working for, for this organization as well. How do you fit it into one podcast? For me, it's it's an organization that is just absolutely incredible. I'm obviously getting a bit old in, in the years now, but every time I rock up at the zoo or the Institute of Zoology, you just meet incredible, dynamic young people who are so passionate about uh, wildlife, about all those environmental issues that are coming in thick and fast at the moment. A really inspiring place to work. And I wish, to be honest, I was 30 years younger. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I knew the breadth and depth of work that you're doing at ZSL. Maybe for people... Since you brought it up, that's a good place to start. Just give a little overview of you know some of the different areas that ZSL is working in. Obviously, it's there's the zoo in London, which is an amazing zoo, but I think you guys have other locations, and then there's all kinds of research and different kind of work you're doing. Yeah, I mean ZSL, you know, formerly known as the Zoological Society of London, or, or sometimes referred to as London Zoo. We are so much than just uh, zoos. Yes, we have two sites. We, we have our site in Regent's Park, London, that is the oldest scientific zoo in the world. And as we fast approach, believe it or not, our 200th anniversary, which when you think is absolutely incredible for an organisation. Uh, and then we have our larger site up at Whipsnade, a beautiful site with some absolutely stunning animals. But that's just a tiny part of uh, what ZSL is. The Institute of Zoology, we really see as our university, lots of young academics doing their masters, their PhDs are studying there in some incredible science, both around uh, animal health and animal welfare, but also very topically at the moment, about how we as a species deal with future pandemics that may be uh, originating within animals, as well as how we obviously conserve both native species further afield. And then finally, we have the Conservation and Policy Unit, where I sit in, which has you know a far, far reach globally. And ZSL, we've got a footprint in around 50 countries 
around the world, you know, from, you know, Africa, savannah to forest, uh, marine settings, even the Gobi Desert in Mongolia. We're seeing some local work being done by local people, local teams that their mother or their parent organisation is, is ZSL. So really, really exciting. And really every day is something new coming across your desk. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you have an amazing job, really. I mean, just from our last conversation, the amount of travel and the people that you get to work with. And it's crazy how much ZSL is doing. And was it technically the first zoo or one of the first zoos? I mean, it kind of came up with the concept of it. The first scientific zoo. So initially when the zoo opened for its first few years, it was only the great and the good that were allowed in. Those professionals from you know the likes of Charles Darwin mm. didn't start as a public zoo or for the public to generally come in and view animals. And indeed across its history, we've seen changes and, and now we very much have animals in our zoo which link directly to the programs that we're working on internationally either around uh, reintroduction and the experts that work at the zoo who handle reintroduction of species or the monitoring of how species are doing the actual scientific work stuff that perhaps uh, species are threatened by particular threats whether they be a uh, disease or, or man-made and how we conserve them and we play an active part in the stud arrangements for key species and a lot of the breeding that goes on within our facilities and indeed uh, many, many zoos around the world will be key to keeping populations of numerous species alive for future generations. Yeah, and I think maybe that's something a lot of people don't realise that a lot of the best zoos are doing that kind of work and, you know, sometimes zoos get a bad rap for, you know, having captive animals, but there's a lot of research going on and a lot of work to keep some of these species that could be on the brink of disappearing alive and having a, a healthy gene pool as well. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, certainly London Zoo or ZSL, we're not about keeping animals for the sake of the public coming along to see them. That very much is an educational byproduct of what the zoo can deliver. The real work that's going on is by the scientists, by the conservationists. It's about protecting the wild populations and, and identifying how best we can do that. So, yeah, I mean, really, if, if people haven't been to the zoo or a zoo for a long time, get along to your local zoo, see what they're doing, because many, many zoos around the world are doing some incredibly exciting things. They've modernised conditions up far, far better for the animals. But actually the research and the story that's being told now through our zoos uh, hopefully will inspire the next generation of conservationists, of of uh, scientists who, who can hopefully repair some of the damage that uh, our generation, my generation has delivered on the world. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think there is a lot of value too in that just public arena of where you know, people that live and grow up in cities, that might be their first introduction to wildlife in really any other way other than maybe a squirrel or bird flying by out the window. So I think there is value in that and connecting people and youth, especially to wildlife and nature early on, on top of all the amazing scientific work. So yeah, really great stuff. Can you go into a little bit of detail about your job and your position there and what type of work you're doing? My work at, at the Zoo John, I'm the counter trafficking advisor, which is uh, you know, a fancy title for, for really saying that I provide training resources to, to help support the conservation programs you know, globally. I'm very fortunate that I work across so many of the programs. Uh, my own background was in law enforcement. I was in the military and then joined uh, what was then Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs in old money as a uniform customs officer working in the channels. And I worked in intelligence investigation and, as I say, uniformed anti-smuggling initially for 20 years and was frontline drugs. That, that was my thing, narcotics. And it, I was then sort of told that as I rose up through the ranks, we had to move about, we had to learn new skills. And I thought, OK, I might stop doing cocaine. They'll probably send me and I'll go and do heroin. I thought, that's fine. I, I can do that. that, that that's still 
I'm still fulfilling my role as a narco warrior. And they said, no, we'd like you to take on the wildlife portfolio, in particular management of the CITES enforcement team that's globally known across the globe. You know, an outstanding group of individuals. And indeed, to fill a pair of shoes, Charlie Mackay was the previous leader who just retired. A massive pair of shoes to fill. An outstanding individual who delivered you know, years of, of working to enforce CITES. And I have to be brutally honest, I wasn't that impressed with that as a career move. And it was a little bit of um, kicking and squealing and, and probably behaving inappropriately that took me into the world of wildlife. Mm. Wow, what a revelation that was to me. Met since then some incredibly gifted individuals, absolutely outstanding. And it really changed my whole perception. The start of my career, during the career, did I think I would end up working in wildlife, 100% no, I didn't. But actually, it's been an incredible journey of education of me finding myself as an individual, but also helping really passionate people to realise that wildlife and the protection of wildlife is about tackling crime. Mm. It is simple criminality. So when I look at a rhino horn, when I look at a seizure of ivory, a seizure of reptiles or whatever, I see criminality. It could be a kilo of cocaine, it could be a kilo of heroin. It, they are being moved globally around the world for the same motives, greed, money, and it's often very similar criminal organisations, setups that do it. And the real strength that I brought, I think, was that I was able to bring a modern policing techniques into the world of wildlife to cut away some of the, the myth around the fact that, oh, it's very specialist. Yes, it is unique, and the science that sits alongside it is unique, but the actual criminals who are involved in this, there's only so many ways you can smuggle. You know, I understand how transport works. I understand how goods can be moved from A to B. I understand the frailties of the systems and how those systems can be abused. And it was really bringing that type of you know, oversight to it that really transformed and further enhanced the work that Charlie Mackay had done, the CITES team. You know, after 30 years, 10 years with the, the CITES team, the opportunity came to, to leave the civil service. We'd merged into a, a customs immigration department and I saw less customs work being done and a lot more immigration. So I took the opportunity to, to come to the zoo, initially working just on Africa, and we were very active in Cameroon, Niger, Benin. We were in Burkina Faso, and hopefully we, one day we'll be able to return. We're in Mozambique, we're in Kenya, uh, within Africa. So that initially w was my bread and butter. And so within a year, I found myself across all the global programs. So from Thailand to Mongolia, Philippines, they're also really very, very things, but similar problems, yeah. We have the rhinos in Savile, where we're active and the scientists working down there, which is an incredible location and really exciting to see the good work that has seen both the elephant and rhino populations perhaps stabilise. You know, they're still massively under threat, but stabilise which is a, a positive, but then to see the problems that we have in Cameroon with trafficking of the African grey parrot, the slaughter of uh, the forest elephants, the implications that the military in Cameroon are involved in that slaughter and are, are active in the transport of ivory from Cameroon into Gabon and, and vice versa. You know, really important populations uh, of forest elephants that are just being slaughtered. We see regularly the, the byproducts of the bushmeat trade, baby chimps, and it's great to work with Apex in Africa and others in Cameroon and, and get them support. And again, the work we're doing there is supporting the rangers. A lot of it is a bit basic needs, you know, when I became a customs officer or a law enforcement, we had an indoctrination process, that formal training pathway that set you up for a career in law enforcement. And that often is missing. So bringing in standardisation of training and methodology 
and really trying to get the ranger role seen globally as being a profession. Really, that actually is something that has a formal pathway, that has education attached to it, that is seen as, as a real role. You know, as a doctor is seen, well, why is a ranger globally not seen? Um, you know, it, it's 101 things to every different person. And, and actually, you know, we need to invest so heavily in these protectors of our environment. So bringing that standardisation in has been massively, massively beneficial to us. Yeah, so much to cover there. You've had an amazing career and yeah, still so many things you're you're working toward and involved in. First, I'd like to jump back to when you were making that transition from more narcotics and customs to this world of illegal wildlife trade. What do you think were some of the hesitancies or reasons that you were not very excited about this change? I think probably prejudice. You know, was this something that really mattered? I didn't understand, you know, the damage, the value, the actual similarities of the criminality. It was seen at that time as being, you know, the fluffy bunny huggers. You know, these were the people who all loved animals. Well, we quickly realised, or I quickly realised, that those skills are actually not that important. If you're going to stop criminality, things moving about, it's actually a detailed understanding of how goods move, how things can be shipped. And that's what I found within the team that I took on, you know, numerous amazing individuals in that team, Guy Clark, Tim Luffman, who had an incredible passion for wildlife and incredible knowledge and actually recognising what my role would be, that I would bring the strategic direction to the team but rely 100% on that technical knowledge. And, and we had some outstanding results in there from you know, the well-publicised seizure of San Salvador, rock iguanas being trafficked from the Bahamas into the UK, major ivory seizures, involvement of glass eels, Anguilla and Anguilla being trafficked from the UK you know, to fuel this global trade Massively exciting. And obviously, you know, the, the the pinnacle was being elected chair of the Interpol Wildlife Crime Working Group, taking over from Sheldon Jordan, the former Director General of Environment Canada, Climate and Change. Really, you know, an incredible organization. The committee are still doing incredible work. And you know, for me, being able to be part of the creation of Operation Thunder. Now in its fifth year, I believe, a global illegal wildlife trade operation that empowers all countries to tackle the illegal wildlife trade as they find it at a particular time. Obviously, from northern to southern hemispheres, you know, breeding seasons, etc., impact on you know how the animals and wildlife will be targeted. And it really has become the or it was the first, and it has become an amazing thing which empowers people to just do their bit. You know, not all countries are as well developed, but every country was able to contribute and you're well over 100 countries globally taking part uh, in the last operation. Incredible results, really incredible results, and actually delivered in a very cost-effective manner. We don't have the big fancy headquarters office that has to see everything. We allow the partners, or Interpol, allow the partners with the World Customs Organization to deliver what's right for them. Uh, and that is, has been something that, that really, you know, I'll take away as being a real highlight of my career. Mm. So with Operation Thunder, I don't really know much about it. Is it mostly like an intelligence sharing network? Is that Essentially, what it is, or so it, it tends to run uh, annually. It's an annual operation that's mm. run at a set period in time. Obviously, we can't talk, or I don't know when it is now because I'm not in law, <laughs> law enforcement. But they do it annually, and what it is 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 that it asks member states through either the World Customs Organization or Interpol to make a difference against wildlife crime too. Yes, hopefully intelligence-led operations, even if it's strengthening enforcement for a period of time. And then really importantly, to celebrate the results that come from it, because quite often we don't see that success being done. 
Having said that, we you know we have to recognise that every seizure of wildlife is actually an intelligence failure. Mm. It means that individuals have successfully got at wildlife and either killed it to move derivative parts or are trafficking the live animals themselves. Um, and we need to really start to move. And I hope that the next steps of Operation Thunder, as it evolves, will start to become almost like crime prevention. The way that police forces, certainly in the UK, and I'm sure uh, in your country, in the States, and in many others, have crime prevention strategies where we actually put in place measures to prevent those animals being taken, being disturbed. If we can do it for burglary, then you know what? We can do it for wildlife. And really, you know, my vision would be when rangers can actually go back to doing the job that they should be. I'd love to see them not walking about with uh, weapons so that they can defend themselves against humanity. Yeah, weapons to defend yourself against incidents, perhaps with dangerous animals, fine. But let them get back to the true conservation roots of what a ranger for me is, you know, gathering scientific data, being aware, supporting communities, being able to deliver, you know, advice, perhaps first aid to remote communities, indigenous people, but being that friend uh, to the environment. And really, you know, we see the struggles. We are as RSL, we're active in Niger. Benin, where we are in the middle of an insurgency. It's very much hearts and minds. And I've sat, I've been fortunate to work with, train, support incredible people. Every one of them can tell me of a colleague that they've lost or an incident that they've been in. And it it really sort of pulls uh, a little bit on the heartstrings. And trauma within the ranger community is something I'm really, really passionate about. From my time in the military and and within customs, seeing trauma management actually be recognised within these individuals and saying that these individuals are seeing traumatic events and we are not putting in place methods for them to signpost, to get help. Uh, to be able to grow and, and care for themselves. You know, we've been unfortunate. We have lost rangers in the past year, like so many in traumatic events. And, you know, I'll put a little shout out to the Thin Green Line and the, the amazing funds that they make available at short notice to provide support to our rangers. But we need far more of that. We can't send these people out as guardians of our wildlife and not properly equip them, properly train them, recognise their value. And then when things do go wrong, in some way help to support their legacy, whether it be their families, their children, you know, whatever, or indeed those colleagues that they leave behind. So really keen to try and find funding from somewhere to do that. But the work we do within communities, uh, you know, is incredible. It is life changing for them, providing innovative livelihood solutions for them, providing them access to knowledge, whether it be market garden systems that supports communities, whether it be soap making, whether it be uh, tilapia farming in the Philippines to help you know provide stuff. I was fortunate. So two months ago, just before the new year, to go out to the Philippines to just one of the world's paradises, Palawan, and see firsthand the community project that's there that, that works around you know underground caves, etc., how it's managed through to the gift shops, the little tourist restaurants and stuff. Absolutely incredible. The community support to that. And while we were there, we delivered training with to local community members who are working alongside law enforcement. And I don't know if it's just the Philippine nature and their manner, their their happiness for life, but the way that law enforcement and community members were able to just dovetail. By the end of the week, you wouldn't have known what organisation they came from or where they came from. They just actually worked seamlessly. It was incredible to see those people and really excited to be going back there to work on a new project which involves the Tamarau buffalo, a small buffalo that that is uh, 
uh, under threat uh, work with the zoo. But I don't, I've got to say, put a shout out, I don't do this alone. My background is, is very much in borders and transport, and that's what I do. But because of the rank I held, I know a lot of people and I've got a lot of friends. And a lot of them are coming to that stage in their life where they're either just retiring or they've got a vast amount of experience. So we tap into law enforcement. We do that through charities like Veterans for Wildlife and Sav Sim, who have both military and emergency service veterans on their, their books. We found firemen have been the most incredible first aid trainers because they practically get to do it on the scene when your trauma first hits, you know, the ambulance might be some way out with the paramedics, but the firemen actually in the first response, and that's been incredibly uh, useful to get you know, some of those individuals out. We've got some incredible work being done by the City of London Police Forensic Science Service. They have uh, very generously offered up their crime scene investigators who come out with us and and give absolutely you know the latest techniques, the best equipment. Yes. We have companies like ScenSafe who are a forensic service supplier who again support us. And it's going to them saying, actually, you know what, you're a big company. We're you know, can you help us? We need these supplies. Can you do it? And it's amazing. There are so many companies that support our work, you know, water to go, a water filtration system that's really great that do bottles. You know what? A basic right, give the rangers clean water that they can drive because they can patrol, they can stay healthy. Yeah, there's an investment in it, but you know what? Those big companies and, you know, I know many of them do some amazing work. You know, Patagonia being probably, you know, you know a leader in the field and, and how they historically manage their company. But, you know, I would look to many large-scale companies saying, actually, you know what, you're making a lot of money. What are you giving back, whether it be to your people or supporting poorer countries, either through the use of your products and the use of your funds? And we need to see more of the Leonardo DiCaprio's, the Gates Foundation, and many, many others cut stepping forward and saying, right, you know, enough is enough. We've seen in Davos, you know, some of the statements. We've had umpteen conferences this year around the climate, around CITES and all that. Actually, we're getting a very, very similar message all the time, is, which simply is time is running out, mm -hmm. you know, for so much. You know, the plastics that are in our oceans, you know, we, we ZSL, we, we led the One Plastic campaign in London to try and change people's perception and use of single-use plastic, our marine work to reintroduce native oysters around the coast of the UK. And again, tapping in to that amazing energy and the amazing willingness for people to volunteer. You know, don't be afraid to put your hands up if you're interested in the environment or you want to find a way into it. For me, the best way is to volunteer. Go online, look at ZSL's website and see what is available. Look at other zoos or community projects and seeing it. And it could be you know, within the UK, saving or supporting hedgehogs. It can be with the RSPB, the Royal Society for Protecting Birds, supporting their annual survey of bird populations, which you can do in your own back garden. All those little things help support science, fuel an interest in, in the world around us. And it's not just for young people, it's for people of all ages, all abilities. You know, it, you know, it really is an exciting area. And no one should really say is that they can't work in the environment. If you want to do stuff for the environment, there's 101 things that you can be doing. Whether yeah. it will be a living wage, I don't know, but there's a lot we can do even in our, our free time. And I'd encourage people or your listeners to, to just get involved. Absolutely. And yeah, it's interesting, you know, the change from what you said was hesitancy to go into this field to now you have so much passion just kind of exudes from you and all the different amazing projects you're involved in and ZSL is involved in. It's, it's kind of mind blowing. That's the people. The people have done this. The people I've come into contact with, that have educated me, that have informed me. And, you know, they are absolutely incredible. You know, one of our directors, you know, spent a year in the forest studying bonobos. You know, and you just think, how did you give up a year of your life 
to sit in a forest and watch bonobos. And they're just, it's just absolutely <laughs> incredible. You know, the self-sacrifice that, yeah, there, there's an interest and there's a passion. And when you're around these people and these types of people, there's just an energy, a real energy. And I see it when, you know, I'm blessed to travel abroad, you know, from the wonderful people that I work with in Mongolia. They were working with a new ecological police department there, supporting them with forensic science, with crime scene, with intelligence management. Wonderful to see. And you get that passion everywhere you go. It's a really touching thing to see humanity when we start to look at the environment. We all look at it, or so many of us look at it through the same eyes. We're all amazed that it's incredible nature or incredible range and and diversity. And we just need to capture that. Um, So, yeah, get yourself along to your local zoo. Find that passion. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, too, you know, I started, I came into this world as a filmmaker and I wasn't starting out as a conservation filmmaker. I was just, you know, I'm interested in a lot of different topics, but through this project, just, I think the the first thing that struck me on my first trip to South Africa and connecting with the rangers and the ranger trainers and all the people doing work down there is, like you said, it's the people and the passion and, and the sacrifice that they make to do something that's bigger than themselves. And I think, you know, I think a lot of us are craving that type of connection. And when it's something like our our planet and literally the nature and the, the wildlife around us, it's a beautiful connection and experience. And and you just see that kind of exuding from people. And, and most of them, like you said, aren't making a, a great wage, sometimes not even a living wage. And yet they still are full of passion and wouldn't have it any other way. So yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty inspiring. A hundred percent, it's inspiring. And again, what the other story and your work, John, and the, the film will hopefully open that up to more people because when you see it, that's what changes you as an individual. Once you've seen it, there's no going back. It will capture you. It will draw you in. You will be filled with that passion. We know that thousands of tourists over the years have, have gone through the gates and of Kruger and other national parks and have been inspired and have have walked away, even even with one that even if they go back home and just talk about their experiences, that's something that for future generations you know, we need to preserve. Uh, you know, I'm a grandfather now, and one thing I don't want is my grandkids to say, why did I let some of these iconic species go extinct? I don't want to answer that question. I don't want to have to answer that question. And that's the question that ultimately future generations will be asking us. Yeah, it's it's a powerful question. The answer is I did nothing. And it's, yeah, it's kind of heartbreaking. So I'd love to jump more into the ranger side of things. And I actually got a message this morning from someone that just started listening to the podcast. And they were actually asking about trauma and trauma care and management around frontline workers, you know, even she, she was coming from the veterinarian side of things, which mm-hmm. I talked to Dr. Yohan Murray from Saving the Survivors, and, and we went into it a little bit, and just the amount of trauma that I think a lot of people feel across the board on the front lines, especially in areas where poaching is, is really high, probably even with bigger animals like rhinos, where you, you see the violence and the damage done to the animal. But then on top of that, you might have threats to your life, whether that's poachers out in the field, in the bush, or at home, you know, people, syndicates putting pressure on you and your family. So maybe that would be an interesting place to start because I haven't talked to too many people about that. And, you know, I don't know how much work you've done in that area, but it sounds like it's something you're interested in and passionate about. So maybe just give listeners an idea of some of the situations that these men and women are in on the front lines and and the type of trauma that they might be incurring and and what needs to be done to to change the current situation yeah you know, the trauma is real and the first thing is is really to, to recognize what trauma is and trauma is when an individual encounters an abnormal event in a normal day and what that can potentially do is create a trauma within you that ultimately can grow, can develop. And there's lots of words bandied about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, and other mental health things. And these are real things. The Rangers, 
the figures are way over this, but we lose probably 120 Rangers globally who give up their life. That doesn't touch the sides of those that are wounded. It doesn't capture the wives, the family, the children that are left behind when a Ranger has, has lost its life. It, we're just scratching the surface. You know, that can be through accidents, you know, a car turning in a vehicle, they work in hostile things. It can be, you know, an animal has attacked them for, for whatever reason. It can be because they are having to do ranger work in an area of conflict and they've been attacked. And one of the areas that we work in, uh, Park W, that sits Niger, Benin and Burkina Faso, we've suffered incredible losses. And the boys and girls, they still go out every day. They still try to do the work. So they're getting trauma. And trauma management has got a lot better, sadly, out of war and conflict. And the system that I use and I'm a massive believer in is something called trauma risk incident management. And I was a practitioner and a team leader on various traumatic events where I managed both as a practitioner, as I say, and the team, the individuals through the event. Now, TRIM is, uh, was developed by the Royal Marines, British Royal Marines, God bless them, in Afghanistan, because they recognised that trauma was starting to become a real issue for them, not just the individuals who were on the ground when, for instance, a, a jihadi attack or an IED had come off, perhaps people had lost their lives, had been wounded in a traumatic manner, but it could be that the trauma was the radio operator who was back in base and was getting this signal stuff sent back to him. But he, these might well be his friends, they might be his colleagues, but he couldn't do anything, and that trauma manifested. So TRIM is Trauma Incident Management. It is a system of debriefing individuals. It won't cure any mental health issues. You're not a, a psychologist or anything like that. But what it does is it identifies and it scores triggers in an individual that may indicate that individual is signposting and needs to get support from a medical practitioner or something along those lines. When people are affected uh, by trauma, there are many different ways or signs that trauma can manifest one of the things is that they tend to be, or they can be quite quiet. Have you talked to your family about this incident? Oh, no, no, I can't burden them with it. So they close it all inside them. They perhaps rely on alcohol to get to sleep. They perhaps actually become gym bunnies and actually they exercise more so that they can get to sleep through the trauma. They might have heightened awareness in certain instances, if you've had a near miss, if you've been driving a car, quite often when you drive past that location again, you'll find yourself clenching up. And that's a, that's a carryover from, from what it is. And trauma is not something that it's cumulative. So every event you get, you get another sack to carry. So the actual event that, to use a brutal term, breaks the individual or causes the individual to to swing over into a place of ill health can be relatively minor. If they've had small incidents building, 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 and those incidents haven't been dealt with, they haven't been given the opportunity to talk, to express. And it really is, it's been seen in the military, the Navy, it's right through the, the British services now. The police have taken it on board Customs have taken it on board, health service, ambulance workers. So it really is very, very common within the, the UK. And we need to get that out to the Rangers. One of the things we will need to do is to break down this bravado that does exist sometimes within Rangers and, and perhaps culturally that actually asking for help mm. is the bravest thing to do, not keeping quiet and trying to say, oh, well, I don't need that. But we certainly need some of those things to, to support uh, the organisation alongside the, the wider bit, which is actually, you know, let's make this a profession. Let's make this a career path that people aspire to, that they want to join, that they have formal accreditation structures. And your Universal Ranger Association, ERSA, is working towards that, bringing together key NGOs, WWF, ZSL, 
International Ranger Fund and many, many others. I, I don't mean to miss anyone out, but actually work to, go, to say, right, let's support these people. Let's create a real trade, a profession they can be proud of, that they can be supported of, that they can have rights of employment, that pay conditions, all those things, and, and actually really, you know, support them in, mm. in the fight. Yeah. And, and just to continue on with the trauma side a little bit more, you know, I think one of the things that I've heard too is, and maybe this is more around the issue of of trust and trusting the people that you would be talking to is, I think for for some people, it might be tough to open up to someone that maybe they feel doesn't understand the situation or maybe hasn't gone through a similar situation. Indeed, yeah. And what about it is it's about training them to manage the system. So one, you know, they understand that how it works. They, there are simple things that actually after an event, it's really important to talk about it, to talk through how you feel and, and things that you, you can do. But it's about placing within an organisation, for instance, the Kenyan Wildlife Service, for a, a well-known thing, that actually they have a trauma capacity within the ranks or within African parks that you actually actively manage trauma that you have a program, that you have it, that individuals know it's accessible, massively important. And, you know, certainly, you know, we hope if funds can be found and we can assist set up those things and empower the individuals to take it forward and just to support these people. Yeah, and it sounds like a lot of people are starting to come together, like you said, and and find ways to support this type of care because, it's not only the the individual that suffers or their team, but then, you know, they might take this back or like you said, if alcohol becomes a problem or mm-hmm. other things, it could really harm their family as well. And, and in a time when they really need help, they're almost alienating themselves and ruining their relationship with their families yeah. because of this trauma that they don't know how to deal with. Yeah. And, you know, perhaps has never been shared or talked to them about or, you know, lots of different, you know, Every trauma has its own outcomes and its own results. You, you never, when you start a, a debrief with someone, you never know what's going to come out. Your know, confidentiality is critical. That trust is critical. It's not going to go to the manager. It's not going to go to this. You know, but it's just someone who, who can help them and who can support them. But very much is not about flying in a, an international team to deal with the incident. It needs to be embedded in an organisation. It needs to be really accessible in double quick time because you're looking at, you must be doing the first debrief within 72 hours. Yeah, Got to be in the ground, got to fully understand it. Debrief management, understand your structures, report and understand the incident and then allow these people to explore their experience through that incident and how they are feeling and responding and, and how they, they want to take it. And obviously, if anything spins off of that, be accessible to them. You know, for all there are formal dates and times when you would do these assessments, the individual wants to talk to you before that. You're not a counsellor, but you do need to be accessible. You do need to be the uh, you know, potentially there but yeah I mean I I long to see that type of thing across Africa and indeed other areas where rangers bravely are sacrificing their lives for our environment Mm. yeah I'm excited to see how some of these programs develop and and how things change let's talk a little bit more about rangers more generally and maybe your experience with them you know I've I've had a lot of people on the show that we've we've kind of gotten their perspective but to you and from your experience, why are rangers important and what's some of the work they're doing and what are some of the the challenges that you're seeing? I know you kind of did a little overview of some of those, but maybe a way into it even is, you know, when you kind of came into this work specifically, what did you notice that was different about the rangers and their work and how they were handling themselves and operating compared to in other areas of law enforcement where you had experience? Yeah, I completely different beast from law enforcement, I've got to say. And I think some of the the big institutions are to blame for that. I look to Interpol, who have not openly welcomed rangers within to their ranks as a recognised law enforcement body. You know, they've sort of very much been left as the, the poor relations 
they get, you know, often their arms through the military or they're training through the military. They're very much the poor relations often in what they get. Corruption walks hand in glove with environmental issues, 100%. So, yeah, you can have one uniform and that's to do your 30-year career. Anything else you have to buy yourself, you think, well, you know, you can't have one uniform. That's ridiculous. So we find ourselves in situations where NGOs, grant providers are having to provide those basic needs. Yeah, there's a pair of boots. There's, a, you know, a uniform to wear. Uh, coming from a, a military background, their ability for self-discipline at times we struggled with. We had individuals turning up drunk for training courses. You know, they were going on the old fire water whiskey in the evening and that had to be nipped in the bud and actually you know what no you're here you're going to be professional one of the countries and I won't name it because you know we're, we're active there we're supporting the transformation has been amazing you know they now first thing in the morning we don't ask them to but they'll choose to parade outside before the day and the senior rank will give a briefing as to what's going on and then it's, it's straight into the classroom so the transformation has been incredible and it's been about actually showing them that we care that someone cares about them that someone's prepared to give them their basic needs and once they've got a pair of boots a hat a berry uh, a bergen the kit that they need they know how to look after it so we spend a lot of the basic level training on the individual's welfare when they're in the field how do you look after yourself because if you can't look after yourself you're not going to be any use within 48 hours if you're out on patrol. So what are the basic needs? How do you patrol? How do you pack your bergen? Where do you put your first aid? Why do you always put it in the same place? You know, how do you get water? What are the options for ensuring that the water is clean? What can you, you do? All those things. What med kit should be carried? Who carries it? Where, you know, all those things that, that get indoctrinated into you in your basic training in the army, we bring them. What we won't do is we will not do skill at arms. We're an NGO, we're a zoo. I'm not teaching people how to fire guns. If they have to be taught that, their government, their military can do that. So, you know, as an NGO, we're very, very clear with that. The tactics that we do, we teach them how to patrol, are all defensive. I'm not going to teach them how to set up ambush, ambushes, stuff like that. If they come into an area of contact, we'll teach them how to get themselves safely out of it or to manage the situation and get, get sufficient resources in that they're able to do it. But we're not, we're, we 100% will not do combative ranger training. Everything is very defensive, very focused on human rights. Every course that we train, Human rights will be a module that, that we use. We draw our material from the online human rights course that was developed by Lead Rangers. You know, it creates the scenarios and things like that. A great discussion, uh, things in that in that sort of African speakeasy type environment starts great conversations. And we've had individuals turn around and say, Oh, I must stop hitting people. And you thought, yeah, you really should, or you're worse. But we get honesty from them and we, you know, we make it very, very clear. The grant providers have made it very, very clear. These abuses continue. They will not give money. We've seen you know, a couple of very well-known NGOs be caught up in the BuzzFeed's allegations. And it's important that we talk about it and we continue to talk about it and challenge them and say, actually, you know, yeah, you're next pair of boots. If you do something wrong, that new set of boots might not be able to be provided or this won't be, be provided. So human rights training, massively, massively important. And we, we really do major on that. And probably of all the sessions, that's been the one that's been the most fulfilling to see the Rangers actually change their attitude. Yet yeah, it's wonderful when you see them doing their first aid skills and more importantly, when you go back and you see them again and they actually say, well, I managed to use that. I helped an Indigenous person in a village who was in difficulty or, you know, and you think, well, actually, that skill has now enabled or fostered a relationship with a group of individuals who so often are seen as being an adversary 
And actually they start to understand, they start to communicate, they start to have a more positive relationship. And that can spiral, spiral upwards into something that, that is really positive and stimulating. We do crime scene investigation. You know, we do all the basics about, you know, how they control a scene. We use the African Forensic Wildlife Network First Responder Guide, great publication if anyone hasn't seen it. I, uh, UNODC uh, published it and printed it, and if you make contact with them, you can get it. It's an outstanding uh, piece of document, but we use that as the standard that what we train from. We teach them how to complete notebooks. We often have to provide them notebooks, explain what the chain of evidence is, how they should control the evidence, the forensic integrity of items. So, yeah, you know, it really is taking them back to basics and then building them up again with your know, discipline. And we've made incredible friends through that. Uh, we use a secure messaging app so that they can reach out to me or any of the other trainers at any time. So we've had them on the Niger, Burkina Faso border, phoning me up and thinking, keep your head down, a lot of insurgents. I've got this permit. Is it real, Grant? So we'll Take me a picture of it, scan it, send it over. No, that's counterfeit. No, it's fake. Not valid. Seize the animals, you know, and that was consignment of Euromastic reptiles. But they take incredible pride in that, their ability to reach out to someone on the other side of the world and actually get their results celebrated. In Niger, we've seen incredible work being done around the Appendix 1 ostriches, which we now know are being trafficked in, you know, fairly substantial numbers that we find in the back of cars and these aren't just checks some of these are you know, almost certainly juvenile ostriches uh, yeah I've got some amazing photographs of that but you know that was something yeah we knew it was going on we knew, but actually fully understanding what's going on has been incredible and you go back to it and you think wow that that is is amazing and then you think they're protecting wildlife while they're getting shot at you think you, you guys are just, and, and ladies are just absolutely amazing individuals. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, they truly are. And it's so inspiring to, to be around them because I mean, just all of the, the things that you just described in terms of support that you've given through training and gear and equipment, it's, I mean, it's just hard to believe that many of these men and women were tasked to do this job without any of that support. So it's, it's pretty yeah. incredible. And I think, from a discipline side of thing, when you when you're when someone is giving you that attention and you you've got the gear, and then at first maybe there's some pushback with the discipline, but all of a sudden, I think there's a sh there's usually this shift where all of a sudden they want more of it, you know, because they they realize that now they're seen as a professional and mm. they're being taken care of and given attention and want to do a good job because I think most of them have that intention to begin with, but it, you know years of being left out there without that support and training, you know, I'm sure I can only imagine the emotional impact that would have on someone. But then after being given this support over time, it's just such a shift, I'm sure, in morale on top of all this. If we don't provide their basic needs, no, it's, it's Maslow's theory of change. If you don't provide those basic needs, you can't grow and develop an organization or an individual. Yeah, we've got them. We've got masses to do. Don't get me wrong. You know, you know, any fundraisers, you know, money, resources, knowledge, experience is needed. We need to keep pumping it in and supporting these teams. But you know what? When you look closely, there's green shoots. There's some amazing organisations, individuals who, against all the odds, are making a difference. And that in itself, for me, is just really incredible. Mm. Yeah, and it was interesting too what you said about Interpol and, and other law enforcement agencies not really taking rangers seriously. And it, it almost kind of harkens back to what you were saying about your own shift and your perceptions of this whole illegal wildlife trade and rangers and, and this world, how you might have seen it before you got into it. And I mm. think that's that's a big shift that needs to be made because, like you said, a lot of this work that URSA and IRF and and these organizations are doing to professionalize rangers around the world and, and get them seen as frontline workers because they should be up there with police and fire and military yep. and, and all these, you know, groups that are supported really well and are, you know, looked at as professional jobs and treated well within the community as, you know, ups, upstanding individuals. Mm -hmm. 
these people are literally fighting for our planet. So it's, it's, um, and doing all those jobs that police and fire and, and, uh, even sometimes military are doing on top of trying to conserve the space and doing all the conservation work. So it's, it's kind of incredible that they've been left out of those conversations. I don't know whether or not it's because so many of them are from departments of environment as opposed to being sort of the, the home office department or the, the homeland security department or whatever, as to whether that has done. I personally believe the resources that countries have, whether they be flora, fauna, mineral, uh, whatever, are national security issues. If a country loses its resources, its people will lose faith in its government to rule and protect itself. You know, how is, where is there a bigger national security issue? If South Africa loses all its rhinos, all its elephants, who's going to go to those areas? The tourists aren't going to come. I know that's an extreme, but those things need to be protected. The great forests of West Central Africa need to be protected. You go in and you see the illegal logging that is going on, the pillaging that's going on, of timber ripping out forests. You know, I was amazed lorries coming from Central Africa, the size of those trees. <laughs> Just that, you know, you think, God, you know, I'd never seen anything like it. And I think, how many years did that tree take to grow? And we just ripped it out, perhaps some through your harvesting. But again, you've then got protected aerial, UNESCO site. And I do look at, you know, the banking and some of the really big organisations who go, oh, we, we'll be the financial investigators, we'll chase the money. Well, actually, you know what? I don't see you chasing the politicians or the high-ranking military who quite clearly are corrupt, who have got their money from sources other than you know, their own income. You know, clearly it's fraud, clearly it's corrupt, and yet we don't see them being touched. We don't see them being held to account. And, you know, you know, I'm not the, I'm quite sure every single one of the people you've been able to spend time with, John, in these interviews could name an individual whose assets could be taken absolutely and that they should be asked to held to account. Mm. But are they untouchable? Why, where is the political will to actually touch these people, to go after them, to, to chase that? and actually seriously damage these infrastructures because the large-scale killing of elephants, of rhinos, it's organised, it's highly organised, it's supported by corrupt government individuals, by corrupt military individuals, by people who are senior within the transport sector who are facilitating that trade globally. 100%. We need to start taking our key resources and targeting them against that, the National Crime Agency in the UK, it will react to serious wildlife offences. What it won't do is it won't deploy any of its serious technical assets to actually disrupt the trade before it occurs. And the question's got to be, well, is environmental issues, are, are they important to the UK? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, uh, it, and it's always so tough when it's something that could be far in the future and maybe isn't happening in your backyard, but you know, you, you can't really see the impacts down the line until it's maybe too late. And I, and also I've, I feel like I've been in some rooms where people bring up corruption and that is a problem. And, and sometimes I feel like it's more geared towards law enforcement or even Rangers, but it feels like everyone is hesitant to talk about the topic when it comes to government officials, because you know, no one wants to be that person to go up against a government yeah. when that, you know, there's there's a lot of countries where I think people are no, but <laughs> will we come out and really do anything about it? I don't know. And it's I think it's it's gonna be tough to take down some of these bigger syndicates when, you know, say a prime minister or a prince or a who whatever, you know, governor or environmental minister is is basically making millions or billions of dollars off of basically getting, you know, selling their country's resources, whether that's trees or wildlife. So it's a tough topic. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I go back to, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of the phrase now, all 
all evil needs to flourish is for good men to do nothing or or something. I've probably got it completely <laughs> wrong. But that's it. Yeah. We know, but we choose not to because actually it might result in some really uncomfortable conversations. But this is probably one of the biggest global battles that we have now to preserve flora and fauna, to try and save the oceans from the, the terrible amount of plastic, the overfishing, you know, you try, it's difficult to look anywhere in the world and not see a problem. Mm. Yeah, and I think we're just becoming more and more aware of how interconnected we are. You know, the pandemic was one one thing that yeah, made that yeah. evident. And, and, you know, like the oceans, we all rely on it and the rainforests affect the whole world. So it's, yeah, hopefully people are waking up more and more to these these global issues and how we can tackle them. I'm wondering for you, I mean, in the in the face of all the challenges and the difficulties, what does conservation mean to you and, and why is it important and why are you doing this work? I'm probably doing it for my grandchildren, you know, six of them all running about, little granddaughter Millie, their birthday, what do you want? All she wanted was insect houses that she could put up in the garden because that's what she'd been doing at school and stuff like that. And, you know, her little sister just loves giraffes. And you think, actually, you know, elephants and things were part of, of my childhood, whether they were storybooks or, or whatever, but they, they came into to my life like so many. And I just look at the children today and say, I've been blessed with, with the life and seen, you know, the most amazing things. I'm still waiting to see the Loch Ness Monster, it has to be said, but <laughs> I've seen some amazing things. And if we haven't got them for our future generations, if we haven't got that ability to connect with nature and actually enjoy nature, whether it be through hunting or fishing or whatever, but in a sustainable, well-managed manner, we lose something of our identity. We lose ourselves, and then what do we do? We all live in concrete boxes, and you know, we're all drinking water that's been purified umpteen times because we haven't got enough, and we wait for the end of days. <laughs> Pretty depressing. So, yeah, no, for me, it's about my grandkids. The motivation, again, also is the people I see, boys and girls around the world, just being absolutely inspiring. And again, as I say, that's what ZSL gives me, and that's why I went to ZSL. It was just about being in an office or being in team meetings or, or Zoom calls or whatever with just inspirational people whose ideas, whose innovation just simply blew me away. And I thought, you know what, anything I can do to, in any small way to, to help these amazing individuals, then, yeah, hey, I'll put my hand up. I'll do that. Mm. Do you have any advice for someone coming into the conservation space, maybe even someone that was a bit skeptical, like you were making that transition to to encourage them and, and inspire them to take this on? For me, 100%, I would volunteer. I would be open. I would listen. Um, try not to be prejudiced around age, sex, gender, whatever. There are some amazing individuals who just blow me away of, from every part of society. Be open to them, listen to them, learn from them, take it on board and just get involved. You know, we've got volunteers at the zoo, from the banking sector, from military veterans, who are all coming up to help cut make silage for the animals. Grand team building day out for them, but they're coming to do it because that's their little way of connecting. So volunteering you know, on environmental issues, or any issue, actually. For me, volunteering is one of the most important things we can do, whether it's getting in to see an elderly neighbour, whether it's you know, an environmental issue, whether it's serving your community, even if it's just about picking up some litter and putting it and disposing of it properly. All that makes a difference. All, all of that makes the world a better place. Yeah. And I, I think maybe it's counterintuitive if you haven't done it, but it actually, I think, energises you and fuels you to get through whatever work you maybe don't want to do that you have to do, but you, you feel like you're part of something bigger and, and in contributing. Yeah, absolutely. And then when you see the wonders of what these youngsters are doing and what they're achieving, it fills me with hope. It really does. It fills me with hope. It makes me go, yeah, you know what? There is a better tomorrow. 
Yeah, Grant, this has been a, an amazing conversation. And yeah, I feel like we could talk for Rangers for probably a week long straight. So, <laughs> And still not do them justice. Absolutely. But I, I appreciate you taking the time and yeah, giving us your knowledge and these stories and encouragement. Yeah, it means a lot. Really appreciate it. And John, from me to you, just keep going. You're doing a great thing with these podcasts, your film raising your awareness so yeah i mean you're an inspiration in yourself so yeah just keep doing it john i really appreciate that all right thanks so much grant my pleasure take care all the best same thank you for listening to the rhino man podcast if you enjoyed this episode and you're excited to see the film succeed please subscribe and review our podcast on spotify and itunes then follow us on instagram and facebook at rhino man the movie more details about rhino man the social impact campaign and future screenings are at rhinomanthemovie.org to learn more about the Global Conservation Corps and their work, visit globalconservationcorps.org. Sign up for the newsletter and follow GCC on all of the social platforms. If you like this podcast, make sure to subscribe and catch up on GCC's Voices of Nature podcast, where Bob Ludke interviews a wide range of people who have dedicated their lives to making a difference in conservation. A special thanks goes out to Simone Wilson for the music for this podcast. He's the brilliant composer for Rhino Man the Movie. Learn more about his work at simonewilsonmusic.com. Until next time, I'm John Jerko, and this is the Rhino Man Podcast. <laughs>